Welcome to episode 28. Um, that's a long title. But the voice of thunder and the roar of lions and the people that make and keep covenants. I think this is going to be exciting. I love chapter 29. I have felt those feelings many, many times over that, oh, that I were an angel. And I'm really, to be honest with you, I'm just really grateful for the opportunity that we have to share these podcasts because it is our chance to share how awesome it is to have the gospel, to have the Book of Mormon, to have the restoration, to have the Prophet Joseph Smith, and to have the church restored in our day. We are just grateful for all these opportunities. A blessing. Uh, it is a blessing. And I'm Farrell. And I'm Rhonda Pickering. And you can always find us at Prophetic Appointments, and we're so grateful for Latter-day Media. So give us a like. And let's roll. Let's roll. I want to give credit before we even start um, on this lesson to my dear friend Robert Kay, who taught me about the roar of the lions. And, uh, and then, of course, my mentor, Dr. Abraham Gilyadi, because the types and shadows in prophecy and Isaiah and throughout the Book of Mormon are foundational in our understanding. So let's learn a little bit about thunder and lions and making and keeping covenants. So we're going to take a look first at some scriptures about the thunder that we might just read right over the top of and not really know what they're talking about. And in order to really understand what's going on with the people of Ammon, and with Aaron and the conversion of the Lamanites, and even with Alma's request in Alma chapter 29, we're going to have to get just a little background about angels and thunder. We'll start in DNC 88, where it says, after your testimony, meaning the missionaries going out to the world with the Book of Mormon, after that period of testimony cometh wrath and indignation upon the people. Now, if you are an Isaiah student, or even if you know a little bit about Daniel's timeline. Or I was going to even say Revelation. It's definitely wrath comes out. That's the great tribulation, that, that yeah. period of called the hour of judgment that is to come on the world. And so we have been granted this period of time to give the testimony to the nations, to, to winnow the barley before the thrashing of the wheat begins. Well, I was going to say a little bit of thrashing may be going on already, but for the crushing <laughs> of, of, the the, grapes, of the grapes, for sure. <laughs> so it says in DNC 88, and after your testimony cometh wrath and indignation upon the people, and also cometh the testimony of the voice of thundering. And now again, it's, there's an oxymoron just in that statement. Do you, do you pick up on it? What is voice a voice? And thundering. Okay. Yeah. There, there's the, the lightnings and the thundering going on, and you're you're getting this, this remembering of, of when the people at Mount Sinai saw the voice. Well, quite often it's equated almost in parallel with trumpet. Right. Uh, and, uh, Mount trumpet Sinai. Loud. And, yes. And it actually says that. But. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I was going to say it's equated with trumpet and sounding long and loud, and it's equated with. Michael standing. Um, We're going to get there. Uh, yeah. We're going to get Here there. shortly in all of this. <laughs> I mean, you got so much going on. Yes. And all of these are word links. And angels shall fly through the midst of heaven, crying with a loud voice. Notice crying. That that crying repentance is, is a very meaningful verb there. Um, sounding the trump of God. And saying, prepare ye, prepare ye, O inhabitants of the earth, for the judgment of our God is come. Behold and lo, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. So this is second coming imagery. Oh, absolutely. And so it's saying that after the testimony of the missionaries bringing the Book of Mormon to the world, then cometh a testimony that is the voice of thunder and angels sounding the trump of God, and they're preparing the way 
for the second coming of Christ. Yeah, definitely. I see that, that that's in context that he says also that after your testimonies, I will preach my own sermons. Exactly. And exactly. his own sermons is this yes. <laughs> we're talking about. Now, if we read carefully in Alma 29, when Alma is pleading with the Lord, this is before he's going to be heading off to um, deal with the Zormites <laughs> and Korahor. So he is praying and he says, oh, that I were an angel and could have the wish of my heart. You're probably thinking of the song. I, I, I always sing this verse <laughs> in my head that I might go forth and speak with the trump of God. Now he's going to tell us a few things about this trump of God, this voice of an angel. It is a voice that can shake, shake the, earth. the earth and cry repentance unto every people. We are not just talking metaphorically here. We're going to see in the scriptures that the voices of the angels causes earthquakes and that it's loud and it is crying repentance unto every people. And he says that he would, as with the voice of thunder, cry repentance and the plan of redemption. Why? That they should repent and come unto God, that there might not be more sorrow upon the face of the earth. And so this is a beautiful prayer that Alma is offering. We're going to see in just a minute, though, that he kind of kicks himself for asking this request. You know, and still at the same time, I kind of relate to Alma. I wish sometimes that my testimony could touch hearts more powerfully. Yeah. Well, not only that, but you think of everything he's been through. Ammonihah, Zarah Zarahemla. All of the preaching and, and the effort that he's, and, and I guess maybe sometimes he just wishes he had more power to make a difference. Maybe some of us totally relate to that. wish that, right? All right. Now, to study about the voice of thunders, we're going to have to turn to Farrell's other favorite book, the book of Revelation, and we're going to take a look at some of the literary structures from our Isaiah classes, where, where I'm sorry, from our Revelation classes that we hope to record soon. soon. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right. Anyway, so um, you're gonna. I know that the print's kind of small here. The point is not that you're supposed to be able to read the whole slide. It's that you see that Revelation chapter 10 is an entire chiastic literary structure. With this, you can see the center where the heart is. You can see the part in blue that's element B and element B matching up. And then in A, you have the introduction of a mighty angel. And then the description that he's given, if I had time, we could link all four of those descriptions and show that this is a mighty angel with a lot of authority. Those are a very authoritative well, description. It, it, it is heart there in the center. It actually, uh -huh. it actually specifies who that angel is. Well, it does. It does. Um, it's the voice of the seventh angel, and we're about to link that up. And then in the bottom, it's, it's that John is going to receive his mission, which is an end time mission that thou must prophesy again before na people, nations, tongues, and kings. So this is kind of the structure of it. Let's look at a couple of details that we need to make sure we're aware of. Hmm. Look how many times it talks about the sea and the earth. We're going to draw a parallel to that Imagine in just a that. minute. Yeah. Well, I think there's a parallel maybe that you haven't thought of yet, too. We'll see mm. when, I, when I bring it in. You're trying to surprise me. I know. I'll surprise you, right? And the little book is taken out of the angel's hand. So this angel is authorizing John's mission in the end time, which we know he is translated for. Of course, you can see that hand is a linking word here. This hand is always the hand of this mighty angel. He gives him the book in the bottom, and he had the book in his hand in the top. We can see that that hand even comes down here, that he lifts up his right hand to swear an oath, and then um, in the bottom there, 
it again the book is in the hand of the angel so we're, we're playing around with the hand here in revelation 10 and the here in the upper part that's in this is the part that's in Kaisen parallel with, yeah this is the parallel with the little book at the bottom here this is the top and it says that when he opened the little book and set his right foot on the sea and the earth he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth we'll talk about that in a minute and when he cried seven thunders uttered their voices so right out of the gate here we see that seven thunders are people they're angels with power they have the voice of thunder. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, <laughs> seal it up and don't tell them. <laughs> I just hate Let's that agree. in Scripture. <laughs> and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and the earth lifted up his right hand to heaven. You know, when God makes it. A decision you shouldn't question it right oh i know <laughs> i'm like alma why am i questioning his wisdom his wisdom is perfect and there's a reason that we're not to know at this point in time what the seven thunders said but i would imagine that when the hour of judgment begins begins we'll start to understand we'll start to hear what those seven thunders have to say now it's interesting I, go ahead i love Let's I stand upon the sea and upon the earth and lift his hand right hand into heaven. That is so linking to Daniel. To Daniel. Yeah, Daniel, verse seven, chapter twelve, verse seven, and he stands on the river and the sea and raises mm, his hands unto heaven. I forgot about that one. I didn't put that one in here. You better tell him about that one. Well. We can do it later or now, but I just, I, I'll tell you when, when we get to the li word links that I did do with when you stand on it, then you have to add that one. All right. In Mark chapter three, I love this because we know that John is involved with these seven thunders, right? Because the seven thunders are in parallel with his little book that he has to take his mission. But did you ever notice that Jesus tells Peter when, that, that he names Simon Peter and then he names James and John. The sons of thunder. The sons of thunder. And he tells us why he names Peter, Peter. But he doesn't say anything about the sons of thunder. Hopefully after we do a little bit of word linking here, you'll maybe have a better idea. John being one of the two that we're, we're talking <clears throat> about here. I have to confess. John the beloved. That's one thing they did in The Chosen. I kind of went, yeah. Because there's a lot that I've chosen I really love, but when they see names the sons of thunder because they're oh, just trouble. Because they, they can't keep their like, temper. Wait, 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 wait. wait. <laughs> no, Not okay. sure I buy that, let, but that's let's, okay. Let's look at what the scriptures have to say about sons of thunder. I don't know, though. It might apply. I've applied on the it very It might have been spunky. Uh, yeah, I can make <laughs> spunky's okay. I, I mean, I married sp <laughs> spunky, right? Excuse me, yes. <laughs> All right, so Joseph Smith is going to give us some clues, and this is going to kind of be, this lesson is going to kind of be a continuation of these prophets in the Book of Mormon that are members of the Holy Order. And we learned last time that the Holy Order was a Melchizedek priesthood and that it was the fullness of priesthood. It was power in the Lord to be able to to move mountains. We we read about Melchizedek, Christed like shut the mouths of lions, quench the flames of fire. They had all of this ability here as directed by the Lord, not according to their own will. You remember Amulek tried to get Alma to, use to quench the flames of fire like Melchizedek and, and Alma said, I cannot because the Spirit tells me that this must be so that the judgment that's about to come on the city of Ammonihah is just. And we're about to see that judgment in the text happen to Ammonihah and why. 
All right, so Joseph Smith is going to say on page 340 that the spirit of Elias is first. So we could we could compare that to the mission of John the Baptist. And Joseph Smith detailed the functions of the Aaronic priesthood and, and what that forerunner is, that forerunner calling. And these are prophets of God. They're sons and servants of God. Now, Elijah is higher than that. And we've studied that one as we were doing the Holy Order. This is Melchizedek priesthood. Joseph Smith's going to explain this in just a minute. And then he says that the priesthood of Messiah is last. Okay. So now, and this is crazy. This is crazy because what I want to know is did Joseph Smith know when he spoke these words that he was speaking in a chiasm? Or was this the Holy Spirit giving the fingerprint of God through the words that Joseph was speaking. I don't know that he knew all about chiasms. I, I actually don't believe he probably consciously was aware of it, but I do believe the Spirit directed him in that way because, I mean, chiasms are definitely a modern discovery in Scripture. Right. They weren't well known even in 1830. Yeah. And so, you know, you could argue, well, he knew what he was doing, I would guess the Spirit knew what it was doing, and Joseph was just following it. I think the Book of Mormon is filled with some of the most magnificent chiasms that that I don't know if he could have written them if he knew what he was doing. <laughs> well, it's, I guarantee you, I couldn't. Yeah. yeah. I, you know. All right, so this is a chiasm in the teaching to the prophet Joseph Smith. He says, Elias is a forerunner to prepare the way, and the spirit and power of Elijah is to come after holding the keys of, here's a linking word, power, and what did we say about the holy order? It is a temple ordinance, building the temple to the capstone and placing the seals of the Melchizedek priesthood on the house of Israel and making all things ready. So we had Aaronic and then we had Melchizedek and then Messiah comes to his temple, which is last of all. Messiah is above the spirit and power of Elijah, for he made the world and was the spiritual rock unto Moses in the wilderness. Elijah was come to prepare the way and build up the kingdom before the coming of the great and day of the Lord, although the spirit of Elias might begin it. That's really cool. And so you have a chiasm right there. And again, we're talking about the different uh, offices, the, the, not different offices, the different priesthoods that, that exist. All right. Now, with that in mind, we are going to go back to Revelation 10 and talk about the fact that this angel, this mighty angel with a whole lot of authority, sets his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the earth. Can you see that that's chiastic right within that little upper section right Absolutely. there? And then, of course, you have the seven thunders in the center. So obviously the seven thunders are taking their lead from the mighty angel that's setting his left foot on the sea and the earth. Now, in order to find out, or right foot, sorry, um, the in order to find out what's going on in Revelation 10, we're going to cross-reference to D&C 88 and see if we can figure out what's going on here. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein. That time should be no longer. Now that's fascinating. And what's, what's super exciting is the more of these links that you can put together, the more you learn. So what we're going to see here in just a minute is that this is going to be the sheep and the goats, the terrestrial resurrection at the beginning of the millennium. And so here we can learn that that phrase, that there shall be time no longer, is talking about the dimensional shift when the millennial day starts. Well, you could actually define it two ways. That time is up. Oh, that's true. Okay. That's, that way, you know, yeah. Time is up. Here we are. It's time. Time is up. You, and if you take that to Daniel 
chapter 12, verse 7, you say time is up and you got three and a half years. The, the, and this closes. 6,000 years of man is up, done. Right? There's three and a half years left and we're done. Right. And then in verse 7, it says, but in the voice of the, in the days of the voice of, and there you have it again, that seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound. So here he's standing up, but, but here it's at the very beginning. The mystery of God will be finished as he has declared it to his servants, the prophet. Wow. I just made another connection there just as we're sitting here. It says, at the days when the voice of the seventh angel begins, connect that to DNC 88. So if that's the first resurrection, this is the morning of the first yeah, resurrection. I was going to say connect it to DNC 88. We're about to. Well, I was going to say much sooner than that. Connect it to DNC 88 when it's when that seventh angel sounds. All right. And jumping ahead the to the heaven, next slide. Right and there. the... Heavens on roll like a scroll. Right there, verse yeah. ninety-five. Okay, okay so I'm now sorry. you have to wait, and we're going to go back. back. <laughs> we're gonna sorry, jump ahead to that. <laughs> I'm doing to you what you do to me. I'm right. jumping ahead. <laughs> so in DNC eighty-eight, it says, "And so on until the seventh angel shall sound his trump, and he will stand forth upon the land and the sea, and swear in the name of Him who sitteth upon the throne that there will be time no longer." So we can see that DNC eighty-eight is practically quoting. Revelation right here. Yeah. But then it says, and Michael is that seventh the angel. seventh angel, even the archangel, will gather together his armies, even the hosts of heaven. Now at that point, when Michael gathers the armies, it, it, if you read on verse 14, yep. that's actually the last resurrection. That's the end of the millennium. But it's right still there. Michael sounding his trump or and, doing and, these things. Yeah. So you have to you have to be able to to Notice your word links, because often when it's talking about the resurrections, it'll jump from one to the next to the next. And you got to know your linking words in order to keep them straight. OK. All right. So here we have Michael identified as the seventh angel, the archangel. And then in verse 110, it said that the seventh angel was the one that stood forth on the land and the sea and swore that there was time no longer. So guess who that is in Revelation 10? Michael. Pretty clear. This That's is why, Michael yeah. standing. You're singing to the choir for me. I know, right? At Adam on Diamond, right? right? All right. So here we are. We're going to see it in DNC 29. And I've got a quote from verse 13, and then I got a quote from verse 26. Just notice that there's a lot of verses in between there. I'm trying to jump to the <laughs> I'm trying to jump to the two resurrections that are mentioned there. The first one says, For a trump shall sound both long and loud, even as on Mount Sinai. And the earth will quake. What happens when the voices of thunder happen? A voice that will shake the earth. Shake the earth. The, verse, the, voice, the earth will quake and they will come forth. Now notice who comes forth in this verse. The dead which died in me. Okay. Over in DNC 88, they're going to be called the, they that are Christ's, the first fruits, they that first died fruits. in me. Okay. So, of course, those word links are, are talking about that morning of the first resurrection, the Adam on Diamond event. Now, down in verse 26, there's going to be a phrase, I, I, I want to see if you can pick it out, that makes you know that this resurrection that they're talking about is going to be the one at the end of the millennium. And, and there's an obvious phrase in here. Let's see if you can pick it out. But behold, verily I say unto you, before the earth shall pass away. It's obviously in millennium. Michael, mine archangel, shall sound his trump, and then shall all the dead awake. All the dead awake, for their graves will be opened, and they will come forth, yea, even all. So what? what is your clue that this is like, the 90% of the telestial yeah, well, people as well. Is obviously a big clue. Right. And, and before the passing away of the earth is another clue. Right. So this is the, the resurrection that includes not just the celestial people or... Not the first fruits. Right. And and this is going to be everybody, which is clear at the end when the telestial resurrection occurs as well. All right. So let's cross-reference these verses to DNC 88. And there shall be silence in heaven for the space of half an hour... And immediately after, 
Shall the curtain of heaven be unfolded as a scroll is unfolded after it is rolled up? That's a fun link. What's fun is when you link the scroll, in one case it's being unfolded after it's rolled up, and in the other case it's being rolled out. And the face of the Lord shall be unveiled, and the saints that are on, upon the earth who are alive shall be quickened and caught up to meet him. Now, this is what in Christianity we always called the rapture. And this is our LDS or Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saint version of the rapture here. It is both a translation event. They're quickened and notice caught up. We're going to talk about being caught up a little bit. And then in verse 97, and they who have slept in their graves shall come forth. So that is a resurrection when you come forth out of your grave, whereas when you're caught up, that's a translation. So both of those things are happening. A quickening. Yes. And they also shall be caught up to meet him in the midst of the pillar of heaven. Now, another reason that you can tell that this is an Adam on Diamond event is because they're being caught up. There's a difference when Jesus comes at the Mount of Olives. It says that all the saints come down with him. Yep. So you imagine how this looks at Adam and Diamond. Mean, I'm not quite sure, but there's a lifting up instead of a coming down. You can tell the two differences that way. Personally, I kind of see it dimensionally, not altitude. Right. It could be. There, I, I've heard a I lot could of be wrong. ideas. Yeah. All right, and then in verse 98, they are Christ, the first fruits, they who descend with him first, and they who are on the earth and in their graves, who are first caught up to meet him, and all this by the voice of the sounding of the trump of the angel of God. Which, you know, if you connect that with Thessalonians and others, you, you begin to identify that angel very quickly. Right. Okay, and that angel being Michael. Exactly. And it, it seems to me in Scripture that Michael is the one that's announcing resurrections. Okay, so as we study the appointed times, and we've done whole lessons on this, I hope Farrell's very quickly going to get millennial timeline and backstory of Israel up on our Prophetic Appointments ch YouTube channel for you so that you can, and, and as well as all of these lessons that we've done on these prophetically appointed times. But when you learn about them, you will see that First Fruits, Pentecost, Trumpets, Atonement, Tabernacles, every one of those are resurrections. Those are appointments with Jesus Christ in the earth at, at a resurrection event. Okay? All right, now let's go back to Revelation 10. And now that we've kind of identified that this is Michael, the seventh angel, standing with his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the earth, we're going to take a look at that phrase that says, and he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And this is uh, something that my good friend Robert K. taught me was about the 72 names of God and the roaring of the lions. So let's take a look at that in scripture. In Revelation chapter 5, we notice that Jesus Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah. We notice that the lions answer to the lion, who is Jesus Christ, okay? All right, now let's uh, also notice a couple of other things. Number one, we're going to go to Exodus chapter 14. Now, in the context of, of what we're talking about here, remember that Alma prayed that he could be an angel and that he could speak with a voice of thunder that would shake the earth. In Exodus 14, we have a situation where Moses is actually exercising power. Remember, he puts his rod out over the Red Sea. Well, we have other instances of that, but also this. Right. But this is like the grand event that is referred to back to in Scripture over and over again. And what we're going to see is that there's actually something pretty amazing going on here in the Hebrew 
in verses 19 through 21. Let's read it in the English, and then I'll show you what's going on in the Hebrew. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. Now we've been there to the crossing of the Red Sea. Why did the pillar stand behind them? What was happening behind them? To block the Egyptian army. Because there's a wadi and the, the army is coming down and they're on a beach and the pillar of the cloud stops the Egyptian army from, from being advancing able, onto the beach. Yep. From getting onto the beach where they are. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and a darkness to the Egyptians, but it gave light by night to the children of Israel, so that the one came not near the other all night. And that was good because they needed time to cross the sea. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. All right. So why is this so important? I can tell you one clue because we're not going to have time. I, we've actually done whole lessons on the 72 names of God, but every time in scripture, you read about the parting of the Red Sea and the going, the children of Israel going through on dry land. That is pronouncing the 72 names of God and calling the power of the Lord at that time. Nephi is going to refer to Moses and the Red Sea before he powers up and shocks Laman and Lemuel. Every time this is mentioned, there's going to be a, a display of the power of God. All right, so here we can see verses 19, 20, and 21 written in Hebrew. So here in verse 20, you can see that the Hebrew is going to read from right to left. And now you're going to see here that what, we, what you do is you take the middle of these three verses. So 19 and 21 are the ends. And 20 is the middle verse. We're going to flip it backwards like a chiasm. So now verse 20 is going to be reading from left to right instead of right to left. This is called a tumara in, in Hebrew, a lateral reversal or an, a mirror image. Now when you do that, then you, you start on the right like Hebrew and you match. You can see right here on, on the right-hand side of the little chart here with the arrows, we're matching the first letter of verse 19, the first letter of verse 20, and the first letter of verse 21. And then we, we've got right here the vav, he, vav, and, and that makes a word, okay? And then we take the next three letters going down and we make the next word, and there's exactly... 72 letters in each of the three verses. So by matching these words up, you're going to create an acronym that the Hebrews call the 72 names of God. All right. So here we can see the roaring of the lions. These 72 names are known as the roaring of the lions. It's, it's calling on the power of the names of God. And each one of these words in Hebrew, it's not really a word, it, it's a sound, but each one represents an attribute of God. Okay, but what's really fun is you can see that some of them match up. So like number 42, is going to be the beginning of Michael, and then you put the E-L, you put the name of God at the end of those three, and we now have the name of the angel Michael, okay? The same with Daniel. You can see that number 50 is going to be the name Daniel. You take those letters, and then you put the E-L, God's name, on the end of it, and you've got the name Daniel. So you have characters in the Bible that are being named after these attributes of God in the 72 names of God 
or the roaring of the lions. Now, we're going to go to Moses chapter 7. And we're going to see Enoch, and we're going to see Enoch empowered. And we're going to see the connection of the power of those names with the roaring of the lions. It says in verses 13 and 14, And so great was the faith of Enoch, that he led the people of God and the enemies came to battle against them. And he spake the word of the Lord and the earth, earth trembled. trembled. So earth we have the voice of thunder that shakes the earth and the mountains fled. What did we learn in Genesis 14? Uh, Joseph Smith translation about Melchizedek. Part of this power is the Ability to command the mountains to move, even according to his command. And the rivers of water were turned out of their course. And the roar of the lions was heard in the wilderness. So are we talking about a bunch of lions in the woods? Or are we talking about the power that the city of Enoch and the people of Enoch had? to speak with a voice of thunder, to shake the earth and to command the elements. And all nations feared greatly. So powerful was the word of Enoch. And so great was the power of the language which God had given him. And then check this out. And there also came up a land out of the depth of the sea. We have the dry land and the parting of the sea in a little bit of a nuance and a clue as we're talking about the power of the word, the roaring of the lions and the 72 names of God. All right, without getting too much deeper into Hebrew Kabbalah, just know that you can start to pick up these nuances throughout your text. And it always has to do with this seraph level, this level where a person uh, that's part of the holy order is empowered in an extreme case, like we're about to see with Nephi and Lehi, the sons of Helaman, in the book of Helaman. And we're going to see some of it playing out with Father Helaman and the sons of the anti Nephi Lehi's. Okay? All right, this is the ladder to heaven that is constructed in the book of Isaiah. Avraham Gileadi has a book called Isaiah Decoded. It has a chapter on each of these levels. And what we see in scripture is that in the book of Isaiah, Whenever he mentions the word Jacob Israel or whenever he mentions the word Zion or Jerusalem, you can kind of make a chart and you can put together the descriptions of those kind of people. And you'll see that they're always referring to a certain category of people. For instance, when Isaiah uses the word Babylon, he's not talking about the good guys. It's a type of the wicked of the world. They are idolaters, and you can put a scripture verse behind every one of these descriptions. They are idolaters. They oppress people. They are unrepentant when the prophets call them to repentance. And as a matter of fact, they kill the prophets, and they're rebellious. We could just put Ammonihah right there with that category at, at, in, in our Book of Mormon reading right now. The category of Jacob, Israel, they believe in God, but, you know, commandments are optional. It's kind of a chuck rama thing, you know, <laughs> pick which one you like, and they're not really repentant. And so this category, actually in the end time, this category disappears because Nephi says that in the end time, there's going to be this polarization. There's going to be two churches only, right? The church of the devil, that means you chose to go down to the Babylon level, or the church of the Lamb of God. You're going Which to I rise to Zion. Taking place as we... It's starting to happen already. Yeah, we're seeing it in the world today. Yeah. This polarization is... 
definitely happening. So one of the biggest definitions in Isaiah for the people of Zion are, is people that repent. And we're going to see these people as Alma and Amulek and, and the brethren go very soon, I think, in your lesson to teach in the Zoramites. Um, now, when you get to the celestial level, there's three of these levels that are pictured in Isaiah. We're, we're naming them celestial because in the celestial kingdom, there's three heavens or three degrees, according to Doctrine and Covenants. Uh, I believe that's 130. Anyway, the point is, is that the people on the sons and servants level are people that cho choose to serve God and their, and their fellow human beings. So we have members of the holy order here that says that they are the elect, the holy ones, the church of the firstborn, the saints. They, we have Ammon and the four sons of Mosiah and, and the, the brethren that went with them are going to go at, at the risk of their lives and they are going to bring the gospel to the Lamanites, okay? So when they begin their mission, even Alma is going to be on a son level, the God the Father, and he is their son or, or their servant. So sons and servants are the scriptural names for, for people of that category. But what Alma is asking for is he's asking if he can have the power to be on the seraph level, the angels. Oh, that I were an angel. So what's the difference between an angelic emissary? Number one, their mission is different. They have a universal mission. So they're going to be able to go to all the nations and they can be translated. They can assume immortality. We're going to see that with John the Beloved, the three Nephites. They also have a cosmic vision. And what that means is the Lord, like Moses in the Pearl of Great Pies, takes him high up lets him see the whole and picture. lets him see the whole plan. Okay? So this is what we're going to call a, co a vision of the cosmos. They have the fullness of priesthood, the sealing power, and they, now look at this. This is super important when we're talking about Alma here. They sacrifice to redeem others. One of the scriptural names for them is beloved. I like that. Abraham was called beloved. And of course, so was John. John the beloved. John the beloved. And Daniel was also. Yes, he was. And they are, they basically are working for a father. This is, this is the father's work. They're working in the kingdom of the father. All right, and then, of course, God is at the top of the ladder, just like we saw in Genesis. When Jacob saw the ladder, he says, I saw a ladder going to heaven, and God was at the top. All right, so this is just a little intro to the ladder to heaven. We actually have two classes on the ladder to heaven um, on our website um, in our Isaiah classes, the presentations there. Now, again, we're going to look at those top three levels that... Alma's talking about the middle one, the seraph level. And we're going to see that servants on these different levels have different power. So sons and servants, prophets of God that have not had the fullness of priesthood have been translated yet or are serving under the calling of the holy order <clears throat> uh, towards the beginning of that calling they have the ability to deliver people from mortal danger. And they are willing to give their lives. So notice here that the willingness of the anti-Nephi Lehi's to lay down their lives. Rather than take a life. Rather than take another life because of their willingness to die, they are going to invoke some blessings on their sons. Yeah. And we'll be learning about those 2,000 stripling warriors really soon here, but never forget that their fathers laid down their lives. That's why the scriptures say that their mothers taught them. 
to believe in Christ. All right, so this is the son or the servant level, and they're willing to lay down their lives, and they have the ability to invoke by covenant a mortal physical protection on a people or a city or wh whatever, wherever they're ministering. Notice that this is a local scope of influence. Okay. Now, remember, we talked about, and, and, and notice also that the higher up you go, the higher the ascent, the lower the descent, and the greater the trial. So here in the case of Jesus, when you have God himself in Mosiah 15 come down and atone for the sins, Jesus Christ is, is going to be able to reverse the curse of death. He's going to be able to forgive sins and he can accomplish a, look at the scope there, a universal reversal of covenant curses. He can make an infinite atonement. It's hard to even wrap our head around what we're talking about there. But that second category there between the son and the servant and God is the seraph. And, and we have very little about that in um, the Doctrine and Covenants or in our scriptures, that middle celestial kingdom. But actually in Isaiah, you can flesh out quite a lot about it. And when you understand that these are the members of the holy order that are given the fullness of priesthood, that are given the voice of thunder, that are the angelic emissaries, then you can see, you can pick them out. You can start to see them and when that happens in scripture. And this is all for a very important reason. Mormon is giving us very precise models of how this works in right. the Book of Mormon. I wonder why. Because we're going to need to know. All right, so those that are on the seraph level, you're going to see that the angels were flying through the midst of heaven, crying repentance internationally to everybody. That's their scope of influence. They have the ability to dispossess and spoil their enemies. They have the ability to bring judgment on, on. And then this is huge. They are willing to suffer, not just willing to give their lives, but they're willing to suffer innocently. They're, they're willing to suffer for the iniquities of About someone this. else in order to save them to bring them to a knowledge of Jesus Christ. We're going to see Alma using these exact words because he is saying a prayer in Alma 29. Oh, that I were an angel and could have the wish of my heart. I don't know that a lot of people wished in their hearts to do this. Well, they don't realize what it entails, I think. Oh, my gosh. All right, so let's have a look at it right here. This is... Alma 31, and yes, I know we're jumping ahead to the Zoramites here, but this is a super example in the Book of Mormon of what we're talking about. Oh, Lord God, how long? This is when he very first learns what, that the Zoramites are doing all these crazy things, okay? And that he knows that they're going to have to go in there and try and preach and reverse the false doctrine that's going on. O oh Lord God, how long wilt thou suffer that such wickedness and infidelity shall be among this people? O oh Lord, wilt thou give me strength, strength that I may bear with mine infirmities, for I am infirm, and such wickedness among this people doth pain my soul. O oh Lord, my heart is exceedingly sorrowful. Wilt thou comfort my soul in Christ? O oh Lord, wilt thou grant unto me that I may have strength? And this is why. That I may suffer with patience these afflictions which shall come upon me because of the iniquity of this people. These missionaries go in 
knowing that they will suffer. And he's pleading for patience that he will be able to bear up under what he will suffer, not because of his own sins, but because of the iniquity of the people. That's incredible to me. It's incredible. All right. We're going to see it again in Isaiah 53. In Isaiah 53, in verse 10, it's, it, this is that famous chapter about the mission of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and Isaiah has done... One, what I think is one of the grandest structures in scripture. And it's in the book of Isaiah, and it's where Isaiah takes chapters 52 and 53, verse by verse, and then chapter a little bit from 47, and then chapter 14 of Isaiah. And there are opposite things happening verse by verse throughout these chapters in two separate columns. There's 21 opposite things happening. I mean, these chapters are so connected and interwoven. I'll show you what I mean. All right. In verse 53, verse 10, we've had these magnificent verses about the Savior, about him being with his stripes, we are healed. And he is a lamb going to the slaughter and he's wounded for our transgressions. These, these incredible th verses. And then in verse 10, it says, But Jehovah willed to crush him, causing him suffering. Why? Why would God do that? That if he made his life an offering for guilt, he might see his offspring, his seed, and prolong his days. That the purposes of Jehovah might prosper in his hand. And so right here, we're going to switch from Jehovah's mission to his seed, to his offspring, so that his purposes can prosper in there, in them, in his hand. And what's really cool is Abinadi is going to actually tell us who those offspring are, who those seed are that are going to fulfill the purposes of Jehovah in conjunction with what the Savior did for them. Okay? All right, let's look at the next verse. Well, here's the opposites. Notice that he's seeing his seed, but over in chapter 14, this tyrant is, his his kids, his, the, his sons are being massacred. Okay, prepare for the massacre of thy son. So that's the opposite thing that's happening. Now we're going to look at what he's going to say about the hand. He shall see the toil of his soul and be satisfied. Because of his knowledge, that's knowledge of covenant. Alma is going into that city knowing that if they covenant to do God's will and to follow him and to suffer patiently, they might save a city. And it's and he says that he will suffer for their iniquities. So by bearing their iniquities shall my servant, the righteous one, vindicate many. All those that will believe. Okay, here's your opposites here. Here you have the servant, the righteous one, vindicating many. And you have Babylon their name being cut off. Okay, the opposite things happening. When Hezekiah kept the law, this is actually um, a comp compilation I made from three of Dr. Abraham Gileadi's books, some of my favorite quotes on the covenant that Alma is making in, in the Book of Mormon and this end time covenant that is made by this righteous one who bears people's iniquity. When Hezekiah kept God's law and the people kept Hezekiah's law, God was bound by the terms of the Davidic covenant to protect them. That principle epitomizes the knowledge or the assurance that proxy saviors have that if they do their part, God will deliver them. And it says, because of his knowledge and by bearing their iniquities, 
shall my servant, the righteous one, vindicate many. Now, this is referring to God's end time servant in Isaiah. Of course, we just read it in Alma. But he also knows that by serving as their proxy savior, Jehovah will spare his people when the end time Assyrian power attempts to destroy them. Did you know that it's prophetic back then and today? Sure. Even in the Book of Mormon? So sure, Isaiah 46, 10, right? Yes. Such unselfish acts define Jehovah's righteousness, which the servant exemplifies. And then here's what Alma was talking about. But a king's willingness to bear the iniquities of his people by answering for their disloyalties to God can be hazardous. Um, how about Ammon's brothers, Aaron, Omner, and Himni in, in prison, prison yep. in, Medo in Medoni? It can be hazardous. Hezekiah suffered almost to death before God assured him he would deliver his people. Proxy saviors such as King Hezekiah, for example, bear the transgressions of their peoples when they intercede with God on their behalf. But the important part is right here. But they do so in order to obtain their people's temporal salvation. Or, in the case of God's servant and others who minister in the priesthood after the holy order of God, they intercede for others to qualify them in part for temporal salvation and in part for their spiritual salvation. However, and this is the most important line, they themselves don't save the people. Jesus does. Jehovah does. Remember what King Lamoni said. Ammon didn't save King Lamoni, even though it says in the Book of Mormon that the anti-Nephi Lehi's looked on the Nephites as angels that had come to save them. It says, they themselves don't save the people. Jehovah does. They merely create the conditions, the covenant terms for that salvation to occur. Now, there are many types of suffering. You can suffer for your own sins, the consequences. <laughs> you can suffer um, inherent in our mortal state. Um, call it atrophy or growing old. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Yeah. And then there's suffering of generational covenant curses, that the cur curses that can be passed down because of the sins of the fathers, or even the righteousness of the fathers can be passed down as well. And all of those things. But under the terms of the Davidic covenant, suffering assumes another dimension, this fathers and son, righteous fathers and sons covenant. The kind of suffering a proxy savior takes on when he covenants with God on behalf of those to whom he ministers, be it a nation that he rules, an army that he commands, as in Helaman, or simply your family and friends. That kind of suffering is redemptive because it pays a price for the salvation or the deliverance of others. This is Abinadi in Mosiah 15. He's commenting on Isaiah 53. You remember, he they kind of accused him. They said, you are such a gloom and doom prophet. What do you think Isaiah means when he says, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of those that publish peace, not destruction. Okay, that's the nuance there of what the Amulon and the wicked high priests and all of them are accusing Abinadi of. Now, Abinadi, being a holy prophet and understanding his scriptures, quotes Isaiah 53, and then he says, who will be his seed? Who will the seed that he turns, that, that it will prosper in, their, in the hand? And it says, behold, I say unto you, all the holy prophets who have prophesied concerning the coming of the Lord, these are his seed. They are the heirs of the kingdom. Again, in verse 13, all the holy prophets are his seed. And they, those holy prophets, those members of the holy order, those people that are willing to go in and suffer to save others, these are they who publish peace. Peace is Jesus Christ, who have brought good tidings of good, who have published salvation. That's his name in Hebrew. Yeshua means salvation. And said unto Zion, thy God reigneth. And again, how beautiful in the mountains are the feet of those who are still 
publishing peace and who will hereafter publish peace from this time henceforth and forever. All right, so Nephi said it this way. He said, And behold, he cometh, according to the words of the angel, in 600 years from the time my father left Jerusalem. And the world, because of what? Iniquity. Iniquity. Shall judge him to be a thing of naught. Wherefore they scourge him, and he suffers it. And they smite him, and he suffers it. Yea, they spit upon him, and he suffers it. Why? Because of his loving kindness and his long suffering towards the children of men. Hmm. Because he loves us. That's why. It's kind of a unnatural thing to take it for another. It wasn't nails that held him to the cross. It was love. Yes. All right, now something else that's cool about this. Loving kindness and long suffering are both covenant terms. You can kind of see that because that's what Alma and all those guys are doing. But think of the first verses of, of when it's describing what charity is in 1 Corinthians 13. It says, charity suffers long and is kind. It's the first phrase. Why did he do it? Because of his loving kindness and his long suffering toward the children of men. And the God of our fathers, who were led out of Egypt and out of bondage and also were preserved in the wilderness by him, yea, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, yieldeth himself, according to the words of the angel, as a man into the hands of wicked men to be lifted up according to the words of Zenic and to be crucified according to the words of Nam to be buried in a sepulcher according to the words of Zenus which he spake concerning three days of darkness which should be given as a sign of his death and he chose to do it and that's the point the fathers in a covenant true fathers like Alma and Ammon and Aaron and Omner and Himni. For I think that God has sent forth us, this is the Apostle Paul, and we've read it before, the Apostles last, as it were appointed to death. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, though you give your body to be burned, though you have power to move mountains, but have not love, you can be 10,000 instructors, yet you have not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. For the kingdom of God is not in the preaching, but in the power. And that power comes from the pure love of Christ. All right, so back to Alma. Patriarchy and kingship consist of a person serving as father and Lord according to a heavenly pattern. Within that pattern. Israel's God functions as the highest ideal of a proxy savior, as father and Lord on this same covenant model. Thus we call Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob patriarchs or fathers, not because they fathered the people of Israel but because they sought and obtained God's eternal blessings for their descendants. And we call David a king, not because he was perfect and not because he exercised political office, but because he sought and obtained God's protection of his people. 
So now we're going to look over at Ammon's song in Alma 26. And if you haven't seen the, the new Book of Mormon video that was just released uh, by the church, oh my gosh, we loved it. I loved Ammon's song when he's praising. And of course, Aaron and, and, and the guys say, hey, you're, you're kind of boasting. boasting here. <laughs> And uh, says, I boast in my God. We have that beautiful chapter of Can You Boast Too Much in Your God? Behold, I will answer for you. For our brethren, the Lamanites, were in darkness, yea, even in the darkest abyss. But behold, how many of them are brought to behold the marvelous light of God? And this is the blessing which hath been bestowed upon us that we have been made instruments in the hands of God. To bring about this great work. Then in verse 15. Yea, they were encircled about with everlasting darkness and destruction. Alma knows. Ammon knows. They were there. And they got snatched from the clutches of hell. He has brought them into his everlasting light. Yea, into everlasting salvation, and they are encircled about with the matchless bounty of his love. Yea, and we have been instruments in the hands of doing this great and marvelous work. <coughs> so why are we reading these verses from Ammon's song? Do you see any important word links in these verses? Great and marvelous work. The great and marvelous work. From those word links alone. Kind of hard to miss. Yeah. From those, emphasis added by Rhonda. Right. <laughs> from those word links alone, we know that everything that's happening with Ammon, Lamoni, the anti Lephi Nehis, and their conversion is a type and a shadow of the great and marvelous work. Introduced by Nephi in First Nephi. If you haven't seen it, our Isaiah class, number 26, on our presentations on our website, is all about this literary structure that spans from First Nephi chapter 13 to First Nephi chapter 22, where he makes a literary bracket. This is the great and marvelous work. I told you what the great and marvelous work is, and... The rule is, in those literary structures, what the great and marvelous work is, is in the middle, right? And so we have a whole class detailing the great and marvelous work, which entails dropping in all of Isaiah chapter 48, which is the destruction of Babylon, and all of Isaiah chapter 49, which is the deliverance of Zion. And that is the great and marvelous work in the end time. And by the word links here, we can see that the four sons of Mosiah and the conversion of the Lamanites is a type and a shadow of this end time great and marvelous work. So let's look at some of the parallels. This is from End Time Prophecy, page 422. The Lord's work in his own due time. He always says it's going to be in my due time. Farrell and I like to say in my appointed time. prophetically appointed time <laughs> on my Moedim. The restoration of the house of Israel, on the other hand, consists of a repeat performance of all the great and marvelous works that Israel's God wrought in times past, of which the four sons of Mosiah and the conversion of the Lamanites is just one. There's there's several. It says that the destructions at the time of Christ were great and marvelous. <laughs> Oof. Okay, so that would All be a time of... too. <laughs> you can actually look in end time prophecy, and he and Abraham actually lists out the places in scriptures that call the events great and marvelous, and you can see which ones are that that they're types and shadows of this destruction and deliverance that Nephi is talking about. So the sons of Mosiah's conversion of the Lamanites and get this, their exodus from among the non-believers. So what is about to happen 
We've already had a thousand and five of their fathers and brothers lay down their lives because of their unwillingness to stain their hands with blood again. And they already did that. And now they're attacking more. And the reality is, is their intent is to wipe them clear out. To wipe them out. And so what happens? What happens in the text? Ammon tells Antinephi Lehi. Oh, to leave. Yeah, I, I'm going to pray. Yeah. Will, will you agree if I, if the Lord says, yeah, let's go? Yeah, go up and, and get an inheritance up along the land where the Nephites are. Land in Jershon, up there. And so they go up to Zarahemla, and then, and then, of course, they get to meet Alma. And what a happy reunion that is. And then we're going to get Alma's song. We got Ammon's song in, a, in Alma 26. We're going to get Alma's song in Alma 29. Which is kind oh, of what we started in. with, yes. And um, then, so it's very important in the type and the shadow that we realize that the converted Lamanites have to exit out from the non believers because that is an end time type and shadow yeah, yeah. where the kings and the queens of the Gentiles are on their mission to bring the house of Israel back to their Savior, Jesus Christ. And at that time, there is an exodus. But this one isn't gonna, just going to be from down in the land of Nephi up to the land of Zarahemla. Hmm. Or maybe from the four corners of the earth to Zion. This one is going to be an exodus from all four parts of the earth. All right, so in the Book of Mormon, we've got this Exodus pattern. Here's, it, here's where we read it in Alma 27. It came to pass that Alma went, Ammon went and inquired. What's with the A's? Alma, Ammon, Aaron. <laughs> i got to keep know. them all straight. And it came to pass that Ammon went and inquired of the Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Get this people out of this land, that they perish not. For Satan has great hold on their hearts and the hearts of the Amalekites who do stir up the Lamanites to anger against their brethren to slay them. Therefore, get thee out of this land and blessed are this people and this generation for I will preserve them. And they gathered together all their people, yea, all the people of the Lord. And they did gather together all the flocks and herds and they departed out of the land. I don't know about you, but I just get these bells and whistles, you know, like, ha, huh, get Gadoni and Laconius and gather up all the people and get your stuff and go <laughs> depart out of the land and come in the wilderness, which divides the land from hmm. Nephi from Zarahemla. We've got so many of these types and shadows going on in the Book of Mormon. Some all right. I relate that to the call out as they call yes. out. And here it is in Doctrine and Covenants. Behold, I say unto you that the redemption of Zion must needs come by power. Power. That's what we're talking about. The power of the seraphs, the fullness of priesthood, those members of the holy order who through their unwearying preaching of the gospel and willingness to suffer afflictions patiently, they have now become empowered. Therefore, I will raise up unto my people a man who will lead them like Moses led the children of Israel. For you are, ye are the children of Israel and the seed of Abraham. And you will not lead, be led out of bondage by power and with a stretched out arm. And as your fathers were led out at first, hmm, Moses, Alma Sr., Ammon and the anti I've been thinking of all the examples that we're, that we're running into here in the Book of Mormon. As you were led out of bondage by power and with a stretched out arm, and as your fathers were led at first, even so will the redemption of Zion be. Therefore, let not your hearts faint. For I say not unto you, as I said to your fathers, that my angels shall go before you. We just saw that in Exodus 14. But not my presence. I say unto you. Mine angels will go up before you, and also my presence. I have seen my Redeemer. It's the first thing King alone I said. And in time you shall possess the goodly land. 
All right. Have a few more clues before we wrap this up. And that's that records have something to do with this. This conversion of the Lamanites. And we don't get it in our reading block. we got to jump clear to Alma 37. And then he's going to reminisce about our reading block and tell us about this conversion of the Lamanites. And he's going to say, And now... It has hitherto been wisdom in God that these things should be preserved. This is Alma in, in Alma 37. This is Alma's blessing to his son Helaman, and he's now passing the care of the plates and the records to his son Helaman. And now it has hitherto been wisdom in God that these things should be preserved. I should have made wisdom a word link right there. For behold, they have enlarged the memory of this people, yea, and convinced many of the error of their ways, and brought them to a knowledge of their God unto the salvation of their souls. How important yeah, are wait. our scriptures? <laughs> yea, I say unto you, were it not for the things that these records do contain, which are on these plates, Ammon and his brethren could not have convinced so many thousands of the Lamanites of the incorrect traditions of their fathers. And these records and their words brought them unto repentance. That is, they brought them to a knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> they brought them to the knowledge of the Lord their God and to rejoice in Jesus Christ, their Redeemer. Now, just in case you think I'm going way out on a limb to make these parallels, Alma's going to spell it out. For he promised unto them that he would preserve these things for a wise purpose. There it is again, that word link. That he might show forth his power unto future generations. And now behold, one purpose hath he fulfilled, even to the restoration of many thousands of the Lamanites to the knowledge of the truth. And he has shown forth his power in them. And he will also show forth his power in them unto future generations. Therefore, they shall be preserved. So, we are to be heroes. Heroes like those of the Book of Mormon. Heroes like Lehi who dared to take his family into an uncertain wilderness when law and order were breaking down around him. Heroes like the sons of Mosiah, who converted thousands of Lamanites to the gospel of Messiah and were willing to pay the price for doing so. Like Helaman and his stripling warriors to whom Helaman ministered to as a proxy savior so that not one was lost. Nephi, the son of Helaman, his brother Lehi, whom God translated and gave the sealing power after he had served God with unweariness and not feared for his own life when secret combinations had taken over the government. Hmm, can't imagine if that could be a type. Like the brother of Jared, who rent the veil of unbelief and saw the Lord whom God showed the world to the end of time in a great cosmic vision. And that should tell you something about the power of Mahanre Moriankum, or the brother of Jared. And in the book of Isaiah, like King Hezekiah, who interceded with God for his people when an Assyrian army of 185,000 men surrounded Jerusalem and demanded its surrender. But still... We're just ordinary people, you may say. What can we do? But weren't those heroes once ordinary people too? Didn't they overcome their ordinariness in order to perform extraordinary things? So how did they do it? How did the sons of Mosiah accomplish what they did? The record says they had searched the scriptures diligently that they might know the word of God. But that is not all. They had given themselves to much prayer and fasting. They had the spirit of prophecy. 
the spirit of revelation because of their studies and their prayer and their fasting. And when they taught, they taught with power and authority of God. And I'm going to add and love. And the reason I'm going to add it is because we can witness of their sincerity, the anti nephi Lehi's, because of their love toward their brethren and also toward us. Next verse, when they buried their weapons because of their love toward the brethren. And now I behold unto you, has there been so great love in all the land amongst the Nephites? And we know that they have gone to their God because of their love and of their hatred to sin. Again, it was love that held Jesus on that cross. All right, we're going to end back where we started. We're going to end with Alma's song because it's a chiasm. <laughs> you knew that, right? You knew that was coming. All right. Oh, that I were an angel is going to be um, your chiasm in the top element. It's going to match with a little bit of a chastisement he's giving himself. Why should I desire that I were an angel? In element B, he says, behold, I'm a man and I do sin in this wish. For I ought to be content with the things that the Lord hath allowed me. The matching element is in verse 6. Now, seeing that I know these things, why should I desire more than to perform the work to which I have been called? Hmm. So he's kind of getting after himself. Tis a saying, puzzlement. You know, God knows better. If he hasn't given me power yet, there's a good reason. I should trust his timing, basically, is I think what he's saying here. But let's move to the center of the chiasm in verses 4 and 5. I ought not to harrow up in my desires the firm decree of a just God. Notice how Alma understands that it's all by covenant, that God is fair and just. And if he says, if you don't commit, Keep the commandments of the God of this land, even Jesus Christ, you be swept from the face of the, the land. It's got to happen. Notice what he says. And this is a beautiful thought about the resurrection. For I know that he granteth unto men according to their desire, whether it be death or life. Yea, I know that he allotteth unto men Yea, decreeth unto them decrees which are unalterable according to their will, whether they be unto salvation or to destruction. It's going to have agency. It's an eternal law. Which means somebody's going to have to cover it for us messy people. <laughs> yea, and I know that good and evil have come before all men. He that knoweth not good from evil is blameless, but he that knoweth good and evil, to him it is given according to his desires. Whether he desires good or evil, life or death, joy or remorse of conscience. And Alma is going to strive every day since the angel appeared to him to save souls from that consequence. And here it is in a chiasm in verse 9 and 10. Yea, and this is my glory, that perhaps I may be an instrument in the hands of God to bring some soul to repentance. And this is my joy. And behold, when I see many of my brethren truly penitent, and coming to the Lord their God, then is my soul filled with joy. 
then do I remember what the Lord has done for me. Amen to that. Yea, even that he hath heard my prayer. Yea, then do I remember his merciful arm, which he extended toward me. And I kind of like to end by jumping ahead again, giving you the rest of the story. But the Lord heard Alma's prayer. Oh, that I were an angel. Could have the wish of my heart. Alma 45, verses 18 and 19. And when Alma had done this, he gave blessings. He's blessing Helaman here. He departed out of the land of Zarahemla as if to go into the land of Melech. And it came to pass that he was never heard of more. As to his death or burial, we know not of. Behold, this we know, that he was righteous man. And the saying went abroad in the church that he was taken up by the Spirit or buried by the hand of the Lord, even as Moses. But the whole... The scriptures say the Lord took Moses unto himself. And we suppose that he has also received Alma in the spirit unto himself. Therefore, for this cause, we know nothing concerning his death and burial. And with that, <laughs> I'm going to remember what Joseph Smith said about those members of the Holy Order that receive the power of the fullness of the priesthood. For God, having sworn unto Enoch and unto his seed with an oath by himself, that everyone being ordained after this order and calling should have power by faith to do all things according to his will, according to his command. And men having this faith, coming up unto this order of God, were translated and taken up and down. So that's just a pretty powerful statement. With that, thank you. We got this. Hiya. Till next time.